we're finally back with the second and probably final part of our Radeon 7 liquid cooling mod. And we did a bit more than just the liquid cooling. So first of all, you may have noticed a few things changed. We'll get to that. And secondly, we installed the power play tables mod. So we were able to overdo the power by a couple hundred watts beyond what it was doing stock. So today we're going through the result of that. Thermals, power, gaming, and anything else related to those, mostly overclocking in general. Before that, this video is brought to you by the PowerColor Red Dragon RX580 8GB card. The RX580 Red Dragon is a good fit for 1080p and 1440p gaming, priced very competitively at $170 and including two free games from AMD like The Division 2 or Resident Evil 2. The Red Dragon series got a big name on our channel when we pushed the Vega 56 Red Dragon to the limits, but it's now available at lower prices with the RX 580 8GB and RX 570 4GB, the latter of which is presently $130 while the promo lasts. Learn more at the links below. Before getting to the first round of charts then, the, the main change was all of it. So the liquid cooler has been replaced. Originally it was an AlphaCool GPX kit of some kind, and unfortunately, that kit improved the, the GPU edge temperatures by a lot, but the GPU junction temperatures were worse. They were throttling pretty much constantly. And so the reason for that is because the edge temperature is literally the edge of the die, and the contact there was good, so no issues there. The junction temperatures, it's the hottest of the 64 sensors, and somewhere in the middle, there wasn't good contact, and it was bad enough that even paste wasn't filling the gaps. And so we took the cooler off, looked at the cold plate a bit closer, and if you run your hand across it, you see that there are actually some very noticeable bumps in the finish of the cold plate on that particular cooler. So uh, unfortunately, because of the imperfections in the surface on that cold plate, it just was not usable. Maybe a, like a Hitachi HMO3 thermal pad might have worked but then you're kind of defeating half of the purpose of the mod. So we replaced it with just uh, an Asetek CLC. You might remember a clip from our Vega Frontier Edition mod where we had my uh, neighbor drill some holes through the Asetek mounting bracket, and we dug that back out, stuck it on the Thermaltake Flow 360 closed loop liquid cooler to Gen 4.5 pump, so it has a faster RPM, which is useful here, threw three random fans on it that were lying around, and we ended up with this. So it, it works, and the temperatures are actually quite good. Um, so there's a lot to go over here. We're gonna go through thermals, frequency, and the difference in frequency stock versus stock with the original cooler. We'll be talking about power consumption, overclocking. At the end, I'm gonna go through some of the very important, peculiar behaviors with Wattman still. So. The absolute biggest thing before we get into the charts that you need to know is that the number you type in for frequency with Radeon settings is not the number you get out, at least not with this card. And so if you type in 2030 megahertz and it says it's running, you need to check the actual frequency because it's probably running more at like 1950 to maybe 2000 is what 2030 means. And then separately, everything must be validated with performance because as an example, we were able to get the card up to, let's call it 2250 megahertz in big air quotes there, because you can type in 2250 in Wattman, and provided you have the other settings, presumably in a buggy enough state where it'll accept the number, the, the tool will tell you that it's accepted 2250 or whatever. But in reality, once you run the performance numbers, you'll see that performance actually decays. This is a bug that was in Radeon settings when Vega first came out. So you'll end up with the score of 1800 instead of 5000 or whatever. And so the most important thing is score must be used to validate the overclocking success. You can't just go based on inputting a number and then does it crash or not. There needs to be a score there, which makes it take a lot longer. But let's get through the numbers and then I'll, I'll talk you through some of the rest at the end of the video. A quick side note here, we might do some extra testing on this. We really want to, but we're going on a trip to Taiwan and then China and we'll be there for a while. So if we do a, a part three, no guarantees, it won't be till we get back. So anyway, let's get into it. We'll get to the gaming benchmarks post haste, but power consumption is too fun to put off any longer. Let's start with plotting total system power consumption of the Radeon 7 stock card, unmodified in any way. 
For our Ashes of the Singularity 4K benchmark, total system power consumption of the stock card is at about 420 to 430 watts peak, with the average closer to 390 to 400. Remember, that's total system power consumption, but we do control the system carefully to ensure only the GPU causes power fluctuations. Next is to plot the water cooling mod, but still with stock settings. This line would potentially reveal any power drop from reducing power leakage, something we've seen in previous liquid cooling mods where every 10 degrees Celsius drop will occasionally get you about a 4% reduction in power consumption. In this instance, unfortunately, there's no meaningful change in power consumption, but there's a reason for that. We'll talk about that after the game benchmarks. We don't get the drop we sometimes see from power leakage reduction. Our next line plot is the overclocked water cooled card, which doesn't use any power play table mods yet and only overclocks using the normal Wattman procedure. Our settings were technically set to 20, 30 MHz core and 1200 MHz memory, but the actual operating frequency is much lower than this due to misreporting or inaccuracies in Wattman. Realistically, we're more in the range of highly variable 1950 MHz to 2000 MHz, depending. The result of this configuration is a total system power consumption, though, peaking at 520 watts and averaging about 455 to 460 watts. The last line is the most impressive. For this one, we're running a 100% power target offset and pushing the card draw towards the 500 watt marker. Total system power consumption maxes out at about 620 watts, an increase of around 200 watts over the stock Radeon 7 test that we first plotted. Performance doesn't scale linearly with this, naturally, but that doesn't matter for what we're doing today. We're just trying to figure out how far we can reasonably get Radeon 7, and it starts with this 620 watt peak total system power consumption. For performance benchmarks, we'll start with Time Spy Extreme, just because it's a synthetic workload that heavily loads the GPU and memory independently so we can get a fuller understanding of the maximum theoretical performance differences. These differences don't necessarily scale to actual gameplay, but they are typically good indicators just of whether the overclock is even working. Remember, with Vega, the biggest challenge is that Wattman might look like it's accepting frequency overclocks, but the actual stability is worse and performance will be worse as a result. So you can't trust the number that you set the frequency to. You have to validate with performance, otherwise it doesn't count. With Time Spy Extreme, we placed a baseline score of 4278 points under complete auto with a full stock cooler for the cooling solution. Our overclocking test with the first driver revision also failed, often causing performance regressions even with small overclocks. So you can see in some of the results that we have here, we placed at about 1800 points to 1900, which is a massive regression in performance. This issue has been pretty much resolved with the newest driver, which is why we're revisiting today. There are still performance regressions with unstable overclock settings, and there's no way to validate that other than performance testing. For the first overclock attempt with the new drivers, we scored 4562 points by operating with a 200 megahertz offset on our liquid cooled mod. Again, 200 megahertz offset doesn't mean it's just straight 200 megahertz higher because it's variable. Using a 120% power target and 1.125 GPU voltage, we ended up at that 4562 score. With the clock set to 220 megahertz offset and a 1.162 volt GPU uh, core voltage, still using a 1000 megahertz stock memory frequency and 120 power target, 120%, we scored 4617 points. This is an increase over stock of about 8%, which gives you an idea for the upper limits of our liquid cooled Radeon 7 before using any other mods like power play, table, registry mods to increase the power target beyond stock. The final result was 4897 points, sparing everyone the slow increases in between, where we set the frequency to a 250 MHz offset voltage to 1.237 volts, which is over the stock spec and uses power play table mods, and the power target was set to 100% or technically 99% offset for a total system power of well, 200% if you add it up that way. The memory was 1200 MHz. This result is 15% over the stock performance number. Moving to another Time Spy Extreme chart next, we can look at the individualized GT1 and GT2 scores presented as FPS, which helps us better visualize the specific areas of performance uplift. GT2 traditionally gets the biggest gains from memory overclocking, whereas GT1 gains the most from core overclocks as it better supports the specific workloads. The final overclock allowed for GT scores of 25.85 for GT2 and 35.38 for GT1, measured in FPS, and showing individual gains of 13.5% over the stock 31.18 FPS for GT1 and 15.2% uh, improvement over the stock GT2 score from the original Radeon 7 test. Although the delta isn't massive between GT1 and 2, it is common that we see AMD's GT2 performance drag more of the weight upward as memory frequencies increase. AMD needs that memory bandwidth on its higher end GPUs, and it does benefit from memory overclocking, sometimes more than from core overclocking, depending on the application and the workload.
Before plotting thermals and talking about our overclock stepping and challenges in overclocking, it'd be good to get some gaming results presented for those most curious about performance gains and linearity of the overclock. First up is Apex Legends, which has already demonstrated an uncommon performance advantage for the Radeon 7 versus the RTX 2080 competitor. We're starting here because it's sort of a best case scenario for Radeon 7, so keep in mind that these results won't extrapolate to all their games equally. At 4K, with all settings configured to high using our River Village benchmark, the Radeon 7 card placed at 56 FPS average with lows at 43 and 44 FPS. Performance was overall good, functionally tying with the GTX 1080 Ti. There was no meaningful difference between the 1080 Ti and Radeon 7 cards. The RTX 2080 Trio stretched its compute targeted legs with a 65 FPS average, leading the stock Radeon 7 by about 16 percent. With a base overclock and a water cooling mod, noting again that the 20-30 megahertz in quotes there is just the setting, not the actual output frequency, we see a frame rate of 62 FPS average. That's an uplift of 10.5 percent over the stock Radeon 7 performance and encroaches on stock RTX 2080 territory. Granted, you could overclock the 2080 as well and power would be lower, but this is closing in in an impressive way at least on the stock card. The Radeon 7 PowerPlay Tables mod puts it at 65 FPS average, giving us a disappointing improvement over the overclocked average performance of 4.2%. In plain terms, and more straightforward and non-stat mathy terms, it's 2 to 3 FPS, which is an invisible improvement, in other words, so the percentage sounds a bit better than the reality, uh, it's an improvement nonetheless. The end result is that we tie with the RTX 2080 Trio, which isn't a bad result, just not as big of an improvement as you'd expect given the power increase. Let's show a frame time performance plot to better illustrate the frame to frame interval differences. In this test, lower frame times are better, but consistent is better than lower. Testing is repeated in the same area and test variance is under 1 FPS average per run, so this is very consistent and accurate as a test pattern. The Radeon 7 stock card ends up averaging closer to 19 to 20 milliseconds per frame, with frame to frame interval deviation never greater than 2 milliseconds on average, plus or minus. This is excellent consistency despite slower than 60 FPS average frame rates. And the power mod and liquid cooling get our frame times down to 14 to 17 milliseconds on average, depending. Frame to frame interval variance does not meaningfully widen, so our overclock is considered stable for this testing. At 1440p for Apex Legends, the Radeon 7 stock card ran a baseline frame rate of 106 FPS average, which was significantly outdone by the overclocked variance 120 FPS average. Just like last time, we see about a 13% increase in performance over baseline with the water cooled overclock test. And also, like last time, we see very little difference with the PowerPlay mod. Actually, it's worse this time. Unfortunately, with this test, the difference was within test variance. It's really no different at all. There is zero benefit from increased power consumption to the core. We believe this to be a limitation of the core frequency as opposed to the 4K results where more of the memory bandwidth is utilized. So the differences don't come out as strongly with a more core limited scenario. At least that's our hypothesis for this one. Time Spy Extreme's earlier GT2 results reinforce this belief. The end result is that the Radeon 7 overclock ends up leading the RTX 2080 by about 14% and is nearly tying the RTX 2080 Ti. Again, you cannot extrapolate this across all games, but it's still good information for this game. Unfortunately, some people will see this and tell everyone that Radeon 7 is almost as good as a stock 2080 Ti, but that's not always true. That said, let's try another best case scenario. Let's look at Sniper Elite 4 and see how close the Radeon 7 can get to the 2080 Ti in that one, although we do need to keep everyone's expectations in check by looking at some DX11 games after that. Sniper Elite 4 with high settings and DX12 gave us stock Radeon 7 performance of about 85 FPS average with lows well spaced behind. This positions Radeon 7 as about tied with the RTX 2080 FE and just behind the GTX 1080 Ti. Overclocking and water cooling gave a significant uplift to 97 FPS average or 14.4% increase in performance, allowing the Radeon 7 to outpace the stock 1080 Ti and 2080 FE, though overclocked results obviously reshuffle things a bit again. The power mod only gives us another couple percent increase in performance, disappointingly, so the real story is in the uplift from cooling and a more basic overclock. Either way, the power mod does start to approach 2080 Ti stock performance, but doesn't quite make it there and is still led by the stock 2080 Ti by 9%. We've looked at more compute intensive games with the Apex, although using DX11 and Sniper using DX12, so now it's time to balance with a more traditionally developed game. GTA 5 at 4K and very high in ultra settings produces the Radeon 7's FPS at 51 FPS average, with lows at 41 and 39 FPS. This ranked it as just ahead of the RTX 2070, only about 7%, while still being $200 more expensive than our tested 2070. The water cooling mod and overclock improved the Radeon 7 performance to 56 FPS average, an increase of about 9% and allowing it to get closer to the 61 FPS average of the stock RTX 2080 on our charts. Overclocking the 2080 didn't get it much in this game, 
and it only created a few percent gap versus the stock 2080. The Power Play Tables mod allowed the Radeon 7 card to get to 57 FPS average, showing an improvement consistent with the previous results of about 2 to 3% uplift. The net change is 11% versus the stock Radeon 7, with performance just under the stock RTX 2080 FE when the 7 is pushed to our Power Play mod limits. It's a very far distance from the 2080 Ti stock card, which leads the Radeon 7 Power Play mod by 55%. That's a pretty hard counter to our previous two charts and gives us a, another perspective of how a game might perform. At 1440p, GTA 5 shows the stock rate on 7 at 99 FPS average, leading the 1080 FTW by about 6.6%. The overclocked and water-cooled Radeon 7 places at 107.6 FPS average, improving over stock performance by 9% again, with the PowerPlay mod then showing some similarly poor gains as seen in the Apex Legends 1440p benchmark. We think that most of the performance gains may be, once again, more resultant of the memory increase than the flimsy and unpredictable core increases. For F1 2018 at 4K, the Radeon 7 card performs at 73 FPS average when stock versus the 2080's 81 FPS average, although we previously illustrated that the Radeon 7 does post stronger frame time performance in this particular title. Overclocking and water cooling the Radeon 7 gets it up to 79.6 FPS average, posting an increase of 9% once again, with the PowerPlay mod putting it to 84 FPS average and improving an additional 5% over the previous overclock. This is one of the bigger jumps we've seen from just the PowerPlay tables. The net gain versus stock is 14.5%, landing it close to an overclocked 1080 Ti, but not quite passing it in average frame rate. Although the low frame time performance is superior, as we discussed in our previous review. Far Cry 5 is the last one. At 4K, the Radeon 7 stock card ran at 60 FPS average, with the water cooled overclock at 67.5 FPS average, which is functionally tied with the 2080 Ti tested back on 417.35. We've not looked at Far Cry again on the 2080 Ti since 417.35, but so far the two are about equal with the overclock and water cooling on the Radeon 7 card. Adding the power mod only gives us a couple percentage points of improvement, hitting 69 FPS average and improving 15% over baseline stock, and adding water and an overclock to the 2080 Ti gets it to 82 FPS average, leading the more power-hungry Radeon 7 by 18.6%, and this is without any BIOS flashes, so it can't go to higher power targets like the Radeon 7 is doing. In our original baseline testing, ignoring VRM thermals for a moment, we placed the Radeon 7 and its Hitachi graphite thermal pad at a junction temperature of 108 degrees Celsius under load. As a reminder, junction temperature is the hottest of the 64 thermal sensors across the package, whereas GPU temperature is the edge temperature, literally the temperature at a cooler edge of the GPU die. It is therefore less useful, but it's the more traditional measurement that you're used to seeing. The junction temperature has a TJ max of 110 degrees when stock, so 108 is technically under TJ max. GPU edge temperature was about 80 degrees when tested stock, and the clocks will boost based on the junction temperature, so that's the really the more relevant one here. Our water-cooled mod, under the same stock clock and voltage conditions, ran a junction temperature approximately 39 degrees cooler than the stock temperatures, at about 68 to 70 degrees Celsius junction. The GPU edge temperature also ended up about 40 degrees below stock, as you would expect, and that ended up at a firm 40 degrees Celsius. Note that the ambient temperature was controlled at 22 degrees Celsius for both tests, and was logged every second of the test with a thermocouple reader. We are not doing a delta T over ambient here, so this is just the straight temperature readout, and our delta would be, well, subtract 22 or so, and that's your delta. Moving on to the frequency over time test for the same test case, we see that critically performance is actually up versus the stock air-cooled card, and this is without any overclock settings applied. That means that boosting is utilizing the extra thermal headroom, which may also explain why we didn't see reduced power consumption from leakage earlier. If it's boosting clocks and voltages meet the thermal headroom until hitting a power target, power consumption would remain the same. Our average frequency for the water-cooled mod is about 1720 to 1750 MHz, with some spikes, although rare, up to 1800 MHz. The stock card averages closer to 1650 MHz, allowing us a 70 MHz to 100 MHz average increase just from liquid cooling the card. There are no changes in Wattman or any other overclocking software, and there are no mods beyond the water cooling. That's a very good result, and is essentially a pre-overclock achieved just by using a better cooling solution, which illustrates that the boost parameters on this card are functioning as they should. It is sort of comparable to the NVIDIA GPU Boost 
routine where it'll boost based on thermals, voltage, things like that. Still, the water mod is more variable in frequency likely due to the power limits, but it averages a higher result and is overall better. Finally, the newest GPU-Z rendition has given us softer monitoring of the sensors inside of the power componentry on Radeon 7. Buildzoid's video on our channel talks about these parts in more depth, but we can show the thermals of our mod here in a more practical fashion. Just to prove that you don't need a base plate on the VRM, and we validated this with hardware K-type thermocouples as well, the hottest component was a GPU VRM MOSFET, which plotted at about 50 degrees Celsius. That's not over ambient or anything, it's just straight 50C in a 22C ambient environment. So our delta is about 30 degrees. That's damn good, particularly considering we have no base plate, no direct contact cooling, and we only positioned a Noctua fan to blow over the VRMs. Air is enough here. We could even run this passively without the Noctua fan, although that wouldn't be advisable once you actually start overclocking with power mods. You probably want the cooling then. Either way, Radeon 7's VRM is efficient enough that it doesn't run too hot. The GPU memory temperature plotted at about 47 to 48 degrees Celsius. We'll just complicate the chart now and throw the rest of the measurements up there all at once. The memory VRM and SOC VRM temperatures ended up in the range of 35 to 44 degrees Celsius, ensuring that this card ran well within spec and better than stock, even without the direct contact heatsink on the VRMs. So closing out then, as we prepare to get on the plane to go to Taiwan, I would uh, keep this, uh, I cut a few charts out that I, I did want to include, but I'll just present the numbers verbally instead. So the junction temperature, with the card using its power mod and the liquid cooling mods. That's, that's the one thermal chart we did not show. The junction temperature there is about 99 degrees Celsius. It goes up quite a bit, but it's still not hitting TJ Maxx, which is 110 stock or 120 degrees by AMD's own configuration when you start playing on with overclocking setting. So we were still 20 degrees off of TJ Maxx, which means we have a bit more headroom, but we're starting to, to hit some limits here where the the power offset just seems like it stops working at some point. So you keep increasing and increasing and increasing, and eventually you look at the power draw at like a current clamp, look at a wall meter, look at GPU-Z, and they're all showing the same sort of maximum power at like 472, 500 watts. I think there's a way to get around this. I have seen successful users in forums who are able to get beyond 500 watts of power pushed into the GPU, which is what we'd like to do as well. Um, unfortunately, like I said, leaving town. So didn't dig into it any further than that. I will leave that for later. If you know of someone who is successfully actually validated that their card is accepting more than 500 watts, uh, please let us know in, with a link to maybe their thread, forum thread below, and I'll look into it as soon as we're back and see if we can get a little further because I feel like there's still more in this card, but the scaling obviously falls off a cliff. Even if there's more power we can push into it, once we got to... Well, once we did the power play mod, uh, the gains start really dropping fast. And there might be, I think there's more we can do in memory too. We stopped at 1200 megahertz. It kind of started artifacting in some applications and stopping there. But I think in some gaming or benchmark applications, we might be able to push a bit higher. So that's uh, something to revisit. Now, overall, the, the power offset's a bit buggy sometimes. You do occasionally have to DDU, reinstall. Uh, remodify the registry depending on, we use power play tables, so um, if you have one power play table uh, modification installed and you try to do another one, sometimes it doesn't take and you have to wipe everything and do it again. We did some basic undervolting, I have data on that, we'll talk about that later. Uh, again, it's going to be a, a while because we're going to be in Asia, but um, we got it successfully to about like 0.9 something, 0.94 maybe, and then below that it just wasn't really holding. And also, quick note on undervolting doesn't count as undervolting. If you undervolt it and then you increase the power offset to achieve the same power consumption um, with the same clocks. So there are some, th there are some really important caveats to discuss there. We, we talked about some of with Buildzoid as well, but we'll do that later. So is it worth it? The answer is... Well, if you're buying Radeon 7 anyway, it might be worth trying to liquid cool it, whether that's with a proper block and those are probably coming out or something else. But it might be worth it because the performance uplift just from liquid cooling it and doing a basic overclock with the, uh, I should have mentioned this earlier, with AMD driver version 19.2.3, it's, it's the newest, absolute newest version. I think it's called an optional version as of today which is March 1st. So the 19.2.3, I think, is the newest one as of today. So with that driver version, overclocking does sort of work now, which is good. It actually, it does work. I mean, if you're, 
if you're not playing around with power play tables, it pretty much just works properly out of the box. Uh, took Jensen's quote there by accident, but it is it is more or less functional at this point. So you can overclock now. Good news there. AMD kind of told us that you it wasn't a software issue earlier, and they thought it was just the limit of the card. But the card actually can do more. So that's good news. And you can overclock. You do a water cooling mod. You get it pretty far up the charts versus the stock configuration. It's outpacing R RTX 2080s in some cases where it wasn't before. It's approaching RTX 2080 Ti's in some cases that are really compute heavy. So specific application workloads like compute intensive stuff, memory bandwidth intensive stuff, you can see some pretty noteworthy gains with the basic overclock, by which I mean no, no power mods, even registry mods, and a liquid cooler. And so we think that's worth doing if you get one of these. Of course, you know, you, you start exiting spec, so if that's not your thing, then don't do it, I guess. But for anyone who's into modding uh, or just getting more out of a, a kind of fun card to hack around with, then it's worth doing. The power play tables kind of work. Just be careful. Uh, once you start doing that stuff, you can push more power into it than is, it's meant for. And, you know, if we ran it with our power play mod, for a year, I have no idea if the card would even still work. It's just, that that's probably not something we would recommend for daily use. So keep that in mind. But anyway, 19.2.3 is the important bit. And then uh, power play mods, be careful with them is important as well. Don't use them for 24 seven if you're pushing 500 watts into the GPU. I mean, it might be okay, I'm not an expert there, but it's, it's just going past spec significantly enough that we're uncomfortable recommending it to anyone who spends this much money on a card and then intends to use it 24 seven, as opposed to just for fun, for overclocking. Uh, you can, of course, step it down, do like 50% offset, you're probably fine, but no guarantees. So that's it for this one. Thank you for watching. Please leave any, any questions. If you think we sort of skipped over something because we're in a rush to get out of the door, please leave your questions in the comment section below. And what we'll do is uh, revisit the topic as soon as we are back in the studio and can do some additional testing. It's a really fun project. We liked working on it a lot and I look forward to working on it some more. So Vega is always pretty fun to overclock and play around with and, and there's more room yet for us to do that. So uh, give us some time, we'll do more. Hope you like the content though. Uh, it's still got plenty of depth. So uh, subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a mod mat like this medium one on the table that's GPU themed to help us out with this type of content production. It significantly helps when you pick up shirts, anything, mugs from our store because that supports our work directly and you go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Otherwise, I'll see you all next time.